Matthew chapter 24 is often called apocalyptic uh, because Jesus is talking about <clears throat> the end and some things. I'm going to argue that it is not actually apocalyptic. Uh, apocalyptic literature as a genre is often, uh, it is symbolic. Like we looked at Revelation. If you're in the Revelation class, uh, we, we saw all the symbols but Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking about not symbolic things so much as he is talking about real things. We're going to see. And there are th in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have this recorded, this event recorded. And it's, called the, it's often called the Olivet Discourse, Jesus on the Mount of Olives, near the end of his ministry. And he offhandedly makes the statement. As they walk by the, the temple, now, if you've been to Israel, you, you, see, you know the proximity. So if, uh, like, the Temple Mount would be here and uh, the Mount of Olives, like a walk from the Temple Mount to the Mount of Olives would be roughly from here to Frankfurt Christian Academy. It's about that distance. Uh, and you got to go down, uh, you know, down from the Temple Mount across to Brook Kidron, and then there's the Mount of Olives. So they would have walked from the city of Jerusalem, they would have walked past the temple, crossed the, the Brook Kidron, and gone up the Mount of Olives. And as they're walking, Jesus leaves, leaving the temple. Look what he says in, in verse 1 of Matthew 24. Now remember, the temple is the heart of the Jewish religion. It is the seat of Judaism. Uh, and it is the, it's an architectural wonder. Uh, you all know my fascination with Herod the Great, and I, I'm, I just I think he was an absolute genius at building. His mark is still on the land of Israel in an incredible way. Uh, unfortunately, this is one building of his that does not remain, but it was to the Jews. It, man, it, it's why they tolerated Herod, frankly. It's one reason why... He, he ruled so long is because he gave them the temple. And they'd been without a temple, really, from, uh, they, they had a really poor temple. Remember, uh, when they come back from exile uh, in, uh, around the, you know, the, at the end of the 6th century B.C., they, they rebuilt the temple. And remember, it says that the people wept because it didn't compare to the glory of the former temple. And so, the, you know, they come back from exile and they build this little paltry little temple and nobody was impressed with it. But it, it was built on the site of Solomon's temple and the site of where Abraham offered Isaac. And so uh, that's where they offered the sacrifices and all. But when Herod comes along, Herod builds this magnificent temple. And man, he restores their Jewish pride. Look at this. It's, a, it's a, truly a wonder. <clears throat> and... They built it. Uh, they, they kept building it. If you go today, like um, you might have seen pictures recently of Vice President Pence at the, at the Western Wall. And uh, their, Trump has gone to the Western Wall. Um, and if, if you look at that, what they're, when they go up there, you know, they walk up to the wall and put their hand on it and pray. That's the retaining wall. That's not the temple. That's, that's, like, that's like the bank uh, you know, if you have a retaining wall by your driveway or something, you know, uh, that's what that, that's all that is. The Western wall was the retaining wall for the temple. The temple was up on top of that. So, uh, but you can, you, it's still a wonder. I mean, if you look there at the, well, the Western wall, the, the weather has worn down the stones and all, but if you go up in a tunnel, uh, they have these underground tunnels that, uh, the, that go up beside the temple and you can always tell a Herodian stone. It's got this special lip that's cut on it. And up there where they've been protected from the elements for the last several centuries, they're pristine. They look like they were cut yesterday. If you keep going up to you get to the northwest corner, you can see where the workers were working the day Herod died. And they, they, just, they just stopped. 
I don't know if they didn't, if it's because they hated Herod or it's because they didn't think they were going to get paid now. But you can see they were, uh, the temple was long ago done, but that the retaining wall was being finished and stylized. And those guys were, you can see the cut of their, their tools making this kind of a motion. And they get right there and they just stop. They don't, they never, they don't even bother to smooth it out. So Herod, his whole life was building on and adding to the temple and the glory of the temple. It was the pride of the Jews. So Jesus, uh, this is about <clears throat> roughly 30, approximately 30 years after the death of Herod, and the temple is still pristine shape. Jesus is there with the, the disciples, and he just says to them very offhandedly, um, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now that's, uh, that's jarring to them because the Jews believe, oh, that can't happen. Even though it had already happened, it happened not once but twice, their temple had been destroyed. And they just believe the temple will never be destroyed. God won't let that happen. And he's brought us back to the land. He's let us build this temple. God will never let that happen. And Jesus, who is in the minds of the disciples, they, they realize that he's the Messiah. And it's, what an odd thing for the Messiah to say. Hey, this temple dedicated to me is going to be torn, torn down. And that makes them scratch their head. So that's there on the Temple Mount. The next thing you see in verse 3, they're on the Mount of Olives. So they've crossed the Brook Kidron. They're up on the Mount of Olives. They're overlooking the city of Jerusalem with a temple right there in front of them. And these guys are still scratching their heads going, we want to know more. Jesus has a way of doing that. He does it a lot. He'll just throw out something. Ah, you know, how hard it is for a rich man to go to heaven. What? You know, they, they, he's always catching them off guard. And so he says, yeah, they, oh, man, aren't the, aren't the, isn't the temple beautiful? Jesus, well, won't be long, not one stone's going to be left on top of another. And he just walks on. You know, a mile, a mile across the way, they're going, let's go back to that. T tell me more about that. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Some, in some translations, that's translated world, but it's not the end of the world. It's the end of the age. Now, I want you to understand, you've got to hear that, their question with two different sets of ears. You need to hear it with the intent that they ask it, what they're asking. You need to hear it the way Jesus heard it. What Jesus knows, they don't even know what they're asking. Jesus says, not one stone's going to be left on top of another. This thing is going to be destroyed. In their minds, that can only happen at the end of the world. And that can only happen uh, so at the end, end of the age. So this present age is done. It's the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, and the day that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. Remember, they're still looking for an earthly kingdom. And so when they ask the question, notice what they say. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They think they're asking one question. You see? They think all that goes together. Jesus, though, well, he hears two questions because those are two different things. When will these things be? That is, when will the temple be destroyed? Because well, that, that's what he talked about. He didn't say anything about the end of the age. He didn't say anything about his return. He just said, hey, this is going to be torn down. They think that can only happen when the whole thing's over. And so they ask him, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And so Jesus answered them. Now, he's going to answer them in three parts. This is what I want you to just understand. He's going to answer them first about the destruction uh, of uh, the temple uh, and how, what's going to lead up to that. Then he's going to talk to them 
about a period that is called not the great tribulation, but a great tribulation. It's a period of tribulation, and he's going to talk specifically about the trouble or the tribulation on the Jewish people. And then he's going to talk about his coming. And these things are not the same thing at all. He's answered two questions. When will these things be? I'm going to tell you when these things will be. And then I'm going to tell you about what's going to happen between these things and my return. And then I'm going to tell you about my return. If you read Matthew 24 as though all this is the same thing, you're making the same mistake the disciples made and you're not getting what what Jesus is saying. Uh, so uh, when we're reading part of this, sometimes I, I hear people all the time talk about what Matthew 24 is saying, like the abomination of desolation. And we're, I'm going to show you that what Jesus is talking about in that case, those are the Roman armies gathered around Jerusalem in AD 70. But I'll hear people talk about it as though, oh, that's something yet future. That's all oh, the Antichrist is going to do such and such. But it's not. Jesus, uh, he's answering the question, when will these things be? When's the temple going to be destroyed? Now, that's just the natural meaning of it. And then they say, what will be you know, the sign of your coming? So he's, he's answering these different questions. So they ask him about it. And so Jesus answered them. Verse 4, see that nobody leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumor of wars, see that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. All right, so Jesus here is describing this, this period of time uh, between his return, between his ascension and his return. And it's a time that is characterized. So uh, elsewhere, Daniel calls it the time of the Gentiles. If you recall, in, uh, when, if you were in our Revelation study, and if not, you can go online and you can watch that, but in especially sp specifically Revelation chapter 6. Remember when uh, John sees... Uh, them open, uh, Jesus is the only one worthy to open the seven sealed book. And remember the first four seals are those four horsemen of the apocalypse. Remember that? And the, what were they? Well, they were war and famine and uh, death, un, uh, unusual death. And, and then the, uh, the fifth one was the, the souls of martyrs underneath the altar crying out for justice. And how long, O oh Lord? And he said, you got to wait a while. Uh, your number's not yet full. And I told you that th those are the things that are happening right now. So we're in the age of, it is the time of the Gentiles. It's the time of tribulation upon the earth. Remember, I, I, I made the case that in Revelation 6, all those things that you see in those first five uh, seals are things that are happening right now. They're not happening universally. They're not happening in every place. We're not having famine. But is there famine in the world? Oh, there's famine in the world. Is there death in the world? There's terrible death in the world. You know, there's war in the world. And, you know, we see that. I was reminded of that in Hawaii. We were in Hawaii, and, you know, we get a ballistic missile threat because uh, this world is characterized by war. There's tensions. So uh, he. this is... These are the processes that are happening right now. So we're in an age where there are a lot of false Christs. There are many false Christs that are claiming to be a Messiah. I think we're about to come up on the, I think it's the 20th anniversary of uh, Waco. And uh, what was that guy's name? David Koresh. And, you know, what, what did he do? He, he said he was the Messiah. What did Jim Jones do? He said he was the Messiah. Now, Jesus warns us here, if anybody says that, or somebody says, oh, come with me, we've got to go out here and see, he's out there, or come into this secret room, he's in here. What does Jesus say? Yeah, 
that's not me. If anybody says, come with me to see the Messiah, don't go because that's not me. And he's going to tell us the way he's going to come. Nobody's going to say to you, let's go see him. You'll see him. And so Jesus says that this age is characterized, first of all, by false religion, specifically false messiahs, and wars and rumors of wars. So the first characteristic is this, that many come in his name saying, I'm the Christ and I'm going to lead many astray. So we have false religion, false messiahs, wars and rumors of wars. And he says, now when this happens, see that you're not alarmed for this. This must take place. But the end is not yet. So it's an age characterized by war and turmoil and turbulence. But Jesus said that that's still not the end. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Now, again, he says in various places. He doesn't say it's worldwide, but he says it's going to happen. Man, if there's anything that this past century has taught us, it's that this world is a world of war and famine. I mean, just if you just you look at what's happened in the world in the last year. Uh, the State of the Union speech last night, the president referred to things that had happened in the last year. Let's go back the last 100 years. Wow. The death and destruction. I mean, we're uh, in the, you know, it's the centennial really of the First World War. Uh, and man, the, 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 the death in World War I, unlike anything the world had ever seen, Modern warfare, uh, you know, they were just lining up and killing each other and then mustard gas and then World War II comes, the, the nuclear bomb comes along. You see, we all see those film of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and uh, the death and destruction of World War II, Vietnam, Korean War, the, we still live, I mean, the Korean War actually never, there is uh, not a, there's not a, uh, what is it? It's not a treaty, it's a truce. Is that right? Or something. But, uh, the, you know, the, 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 that's still tr We're actually still in a state of war with Korea, technically, because we didn't reach a peace. We just had a demilitarized zone. And, man, we're, we're seeing that. Again, this is a, this is a world of war. Uh, you, you, you know, it was, watching uh, what's taking place in, in uh, Burma or Myanmar, and Aung San Suu Kyi won the Nobel Prize, the, the Peace Prize. And now she has largely justified the genocide of the Rohingya. It's, it's just a weird world. You see, here's somebody that the world held up as an, an icon of peace. But she's pretty, she's okay with the extermination of the Rohingya. And this is just what our world is. Our, our world is a place of war, of famine, of pestilence, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And he says, in various places, and man, that, that's what it is. It's, it's in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Remember how Paul says that all the creation is in travail. Uh, it's groaning, awaiting the adoption. So this is the picture of the world. The world is like a, a woman in labor, ready to be delivered of that child. It's a time of great travail and pain. But at the end, there's birth of something wonderful. And this is what Jesus is saying, that we're, we're in this time of tribulation, of pain. But it's like birth pains. But he says, when you see these signs, this is just the beginning of birth pains. There, there's going to be more. Verse 9 we see that it's a time of the persecution of Christians. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation or to trouble and put you to death and you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Well, again, this is, this is the history of Christianity. Uh, to this day, we, we've seen the hatred of the world against Christianity. We've seen it in overt ways, like ISIS going into Christian homes in Syria, just exterminating people. We've seen it in subtle ways. I read in an article this morning, uh, one author in the New York Times, he was talking about things that the president said in his 
a State of the Union address last night, and when he got to the phrase religious liberty, he put it in what, I, what you know, they call scare quotes. But he talked about religious liberty as though, you know, I mean, it, you would never do that and say he talked about racial justice. I mean, if somebody put scare quotes around racial justice, what does that tell you? They're a racist, right? They think it's not a real thing. And so, they, you know, they, oh, racial justice. They're mocking the notion. This, this, this guy in the New York Times today uh, talks about, uh, Frank Bruni talks about religious liberty. Oh, you know, that he's just playing to his base. Well, I would hope that any president of any party would uh, protect the religious liberty of Americans since that is the first liberty inscribed in the Constitution. But I think we all know that's not the way it's going. Uh, that we really are seeing an erosion of religious liberty and we've got it better than most of the world. And yet we're, we're seeing it here. There's no religious liberty in uh, Saudi Arabia. There's no religious liberty in Iran. Uh, and so we see it overtly. We see it subtly. Uh, Jesus said they're going to hate you. They're going to put you to death. Some will be false believers and they'll fall away. They'll betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. So he says this, is, this, this era is characterized by just the lack of natural love and affection. Uh, because there's such lawlessness, there's also lovelessness. Uh, and, and yet, through it all, are there some who are genuinely saved? Are there some that are faithful? Yes, because he says, verse 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. So this age is characterized by all of these things. At the same time that there is an attack on the truth, there are false believers and betrayal and nations that hate the gospel. He says, even through it all, the gospel is going to be proclaimed to the whole world. And uh, there's going to be a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now, I will tell you what I think that means and doesn't mean. There are some who believe that what this means is Jesus can't come back yet uh, until uh, every person has heard the gospel. Well, I don't believe that. Uh, I don't think that that's what that's saying. I, the reality, and, and some people say, well, it's got to, the gospel's got to go to every language group. Well, make no mistake, I want the gospel to go to every language group. And we as believers should find it completely unacceptable that there are people in the world in 2018 who have never, ever heard the name of Jesus. There's nothing about that that should be acceptable to us. And we should be going and sending and giving so that every person can hear the gospel. But having said that, I also don't believe that this means that God's up in heaven waiting until every person's heard of the gospel and only then can Jesus come back. When he says uh, that, <clears throat> that uh, the, the gospel will be proclaimed to the whole world, I don't know how God's keeping score of that. If he's saying, well, on every continent, well, the gospel has been preached on every continent. If he's saying in every country, um, I, I used to be a trainer for Evangelism Explosion, and one time they sent me somewhere to train uh, some guys that were uh, from a certain Muslim country that was closed and they wanted me to train them and they were going to go in undercover and there were Christians in there that they were training in the evangelism explosion how to share the gospel and it and at that time uh, this was back in the 1990s evangelism explosion started by Dr. D. James Kennedy claimed that they had representatives in every country in the world uh, now again I can't 
I can tell you that I know they said it. I can't verify that it actually happened or what, how they were counting either. But we have reason to believe that the gospel has been proclaimed in every, every nation on some level. But within each nation, there are a lot of people groups and languages. And there are lots of languages where there's no Bible. There's lots of languages where they've never heard the gospel. Uh, there are micro languages. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know how God's taking account of this. Here's what I know. He's commanded us to preach the gospel to every creature. He's commanded us to go into all the world. And we should be doing that as long as God leaves us here and until Jesus comes, we should be doing that. And we should not be satisfied that there are people who've never heard the gospel. It should, it should break our hearts. It should weigh on us. It should be constantly in our thoughts. And we should be praying and giving and going. But I don't believe that in such a way that I think Jesus can't come back today. I think he, I think he can uh, I think this is representative of that entire age, what we call the age of the Gentiles. It's the period between his ascension and his return. And it's characteristic of these things that, that Jesus enumerated here. But in verse 15, now he turns his attention specifically on the particular tribulation to the Jewish people. And this is a tribulation that began really in uh, around A.D. 70 in a very sp specific way and continues to the present day. So Jesus has is, is told them what the age is going to be like, but now he's going to focus in. They've asked, when will these things be? So when will the temple be destroyed? And Jesus tells them, here's how you know. Here's the sign. Uh, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Now, he's referring here to Daniel chapter 9. And God gives Daniel a vision of the future. And Daniel talks about the abomination of desolation. And we might say, well, uh, what, what is this abomination of desolation? Well, thankfully, we don't even have to guess. Uh, because... Matthew calls it the abomination of desolation, and Mark calls it the abomination of desolation, but Luke calls it the army. And so we know he's talking about the army of Titus. And Jesus is warning them. Remember, so he's saying this somewhere in the 30s. And these are people, you know, I mean, I lived in the, in the 80s. So if you're talking in the 80s, looking forward to the the 2010s it's roughly the same time frame you know that's that's a generation and there's some that are listening to jesus say this there's going to be alive in ad 70 and he's telling them what the signs are here's here's how you know when the temple's about to be destroyed when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel standing in the holy place so he's just talked about the temple and he says there's going to be an army this, this, uh, this uh, sacrilegious army is going to come and they're going to profane the temple. They're going to profane the holy place. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea, see, so see, he's not talking about something worldwide. He's talking about something in Judea, which is the, the region around Jerusalem. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down to take what's in his house. Let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days. He said, oh, if, you, if, you, if you have to care for a child, it's going to be especially difficult. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be not the, no, this is no article there, not the great tribulation, but great tribulation or a great tribulation. So Jesus says, look, you can know when this is going to happen. If you're in Judea and suddenly you see an invading army coming 
and they surround and they, they go up there to profane the holy place, you get out of town and you get out right now. Uh, pray that it won't happen in the winter because, man, it'd be doubly hard for you to have to flee in the winter. Pray that uh, it's not on the Sabbath. Uh, and so you are not restricted in any way. Uh, woe to those that have children, those who are pregnant. It'll be really difficult for women who are caring for children to flee. Man, he, Jesus says, uh, here are the signs. Watch for the signs. And when they come, you go. And we know from Josephus that this happened exactly like Jesus said it would happen. In fact, it's so specific to what Jesus said would happen. Liberals read the Gospels and say, well, they all had to be written after AD 70. And indeed, they, they date them after AD 70 specifically because of that, because they discount any predictive prophecy. Well, I don't. I think, I think Jesus had that ability, and he knew what was going to happen, and he told them exactly the way it would happen. We also know from history that the Christians in Jerusalem saw the signs and fled. They, they knew what Jesus had said, and they did get out of town. Uh, but, of course, and you know, if you've ever been to Israel, uh, there was a group of what they called zealots who fled to Masada, uh, Herod's uh, fortress down there in the desert by the Dead Sea, and held out for three more years. And the Roman army uh, was, you know, they just simply couldn't let that happen. I mean, it's not like that was some great military victory, but they just couldn't even, they couldn't even have a symbol of Jewish independence. And they had to kill them. And it was worth them spending three years in the desert building a ramp. And of course, you know, the story, the night before they broke through the wall, all those zealots committed mass suicide. And I think there were one or two that lived to sort of tell the tale. Josephus talks about it. There's been a lot written about it. Uh, but Jesus warns about it. And it happened exactly like what he said. And so this persecution of the Jews that begins, Titus, who led the Roman army and destroyed the temple. And man, uh, so if you go there today, what's fascinating, I did not know that, that that stone would burn. But do you know stone will burn? And the stone of the temple, Titus burned it. And uh, you, you can, like uh, our, every guy I've ever had talks about it, and they, they get it to a certain heat temperature, and it, and, uh, it changes the properties of it. Uh, it's like 3,000 degrees. Uh, and they could pull it down and destroy it, changes the color. And you go there today, uh, you can see in what was the street beside the temple, you can see the stone that they set afire. Uh, it's, re it's really something to see. And indeed, exactly like Jesus said, there's nothing up on the temple level that, that, that is standing that was standing when Jesus said it that day. Now, the retaining walls and all down there, but those aren't, those aren't the walls of the temple. You had the so you had like the platform called the Temple Mount, and on it stood the temple. And there, nothing survived from the temple, not a thing. And what Jesus said was exactly true. So, he, so he's talked about the age in verses uh, 3 through 14. Now he's talking about what's happening specifically to the Jews, beginning with the, the destruction of the temple. Uh, he said... Verse 21, then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. So what, what's Jesus saying? How is this destruction different than anything the world has ever seen? Well, uh, I know it's a, it's a strange thing to think about, but there have been other there have been other persecutions of people there have been other atrocities committed that have been great what you've not seen is any other people that have survived and been persecuted for millennia 
Now, you, you think about the persecution of the Jewish people. Uh, th this has been for literally millennia now, two millennia. And without any kind of a homeland uh, until uh, fairly recently, and of course the vast majority of Jews still don't live in Israel. I mean, there's a lot more Jews in the world than there are in Israel. And this, this persecution has taken place. They've been persecuted through the millennia. And so Jesus said there's nothing else that's ever been like it. So there are no Edomites. There are no Moabites. They were wiped out. But this, is, this has been like torture. So there's been an ongoing persecution and death for literally centuries and, and even millennia. He said there's nothing been, been like it in, uh, from, in the whole world. And verse 22, if those days had not been cut short, no human being will be saved. In other words, Jesus is saying if it hadn't been for God's restraint, all of them would be wiped out. It was only God's restraint that preserved any of them. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So, by the way, I want, again, to point out to you, there's a remnant within the group. So there, there's all the Jews that are being persecuted and tormented. But Jesus says, but within that group, for the elect's sake, for those that are followers of his, these days are cut short uh, for their sake. Verse 23, so then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Here's what I understand Jesus to be saying. Christians can be a gullible bunch. That's what he's saying, isn't it? He's saying, don't believe it. How many times is, you know, you read in the Bible, Jesus says, nobody knows the day or the hour, and yet, Every time somebody comes out with a date, Jesus is going to return. There are a bunch of idiot Christians who believe it in spite of what the Bible says. Here he says, look, don't believe if there's anybody says this is the Messiah. Don't go out to him. That's not the Christ. And yet Jim, uh, Jim Jones can find followers to go to Guyana with him. And uh, a David Koresh can find people to hole up in Waco with him. It's like... You know, any, any false Messiah can find people gullible enough to believe him in spite of what the Bible says. And Jesus said, see, I've told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, Jesus says, when I come, nobody's going to have to wonder if it's me. He said, when lightning comes, it lights up the sky. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows, oh man, did you see that lightning? It, 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 there's darkness and suddenly, boom, there's light. Wow, you saw that. And Jesus said, when I come, that's the way it's going to be. It, it's going to be visible. Nobody's going to, it's not local. It's not in an inner room. It's not out in the wilderness. It's in the sky. What, what did the angel say when Jesus ascended to heaven? Hey, you men of Galilee, what are you looking at? Why are you stand gazing, looking up into heaven? This same Jesus will come again. In the same way. You know, that's, that's what the angel said. He's coming again. He's coming in the same way, which is visible. And he's coming in the clouds. Paul says he's going to, we'll be caught up and so will we be with him. Uh, and we're going to be caught up in the clouds together with him. We'll be with him. Uh, there's no question about it. It's not local. We don't have to go to him. How do I know that? Look at the next verse. This verse has caused some people a lot of difficulty, but again, if you just get in the flow of what Jesus is saying, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Now, that, it's not unlike Jesus to use an odd metaphor, by the way. He uses a lot of odd metaphors. 
he compares prayer to a woman begging an unjust judge. Well, that's strange. I don't think I'd ever use that as a sermon illustration. Frankly, I, I'd, I'd try and come up with something positive, right? And if I'd use something like that, people would go, Pastor, that was a bad illustration. But nobody says that to Jesus, and with good reason. But Jesus uses these weird illustrations, and they are riveting. They catch our attention. Uh, and he says here, where the, where the corpse is, where there's, where there's death, the buzzards gather. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, what's he talking about? He's saying, don't go. If somebody says, there's the Christ. He said, what he's saying is, um, it's going to be like the lightning. Everybody will see it. It's going to be like buzzards going to a corpse. It'll happen naturally. You will be drawn. And Jesus uses this uh, metaphor of a corpse because he is going through death for us. He's saying this before he dies. He's going through death. And we're going to be drawn to him who died for us. So Jesus says, you don't ever have to worry about whether or not you're going to miss the second coming. You will not miss it. Uh, buzzards don't miss the death. They, they're just drawn to it inexorably. And so we will be drawn to him, drawn naturally to him. You don't have to be told to go. And then he says, so look how he's, now again, let's back up and think how he's, he's unfolded this. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus begins by telling them the characteristic of the age like those first five seals in the book of Revelation chapter 6, right? Here's what it's going to be. Wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, uh, persecution of Christians, all of that's going to be going on. And there's going to be a special persecution on the Jews. Remember, this is the time of the Gentiles, and it's going to begin in A.D. 70. Uh, when I say special persecution on the Jews, I, I don't mean that Jesus is advocating that. He's merely describing that's what's going to take place. And that, the, that their persecution has been unlike anything else the world has seen. And it begins with the army gathering there in Jerusalem. Jesus said, when you see that, flee, get out of town, because that's when these things are going to be. But he says, and he said, during this age, when all, there's all this turmoil, this mass of humanity like the troubled sea in the book of Revelation, all the chaos... Don't be led astray when somebody says, go out to the Christ. He's here. He's there. No, no, that's not the way it's going to be. When I come, it's going to be like the lightning from the east to the west. And uh, you're going to be drawn inexorably to it, just like a buzzard to a corpse. You don't have to worry about whether or not it will happen. And then he says, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation. So immediately after, and he's described this as tribulation. This is a time of Tr trouble, a time of, time of tribulation. Immediately after that, so the end of this age of the Gentiles, uh, the, uh, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So Jesus says, all right, at the end of this age, when the Son of Man comes, so immediately after this, this time of tribulation, the time of the Gentiles, uh, there's going to be cosmic signs. Now here's where a lot of uh, Bible scholars and interpreters, even very conservative ones, they say, well, Jesus is using apocalyptic language. And uh, this is talking about uh, when he talks about the, the sun and the stars uh, falling from heaven, powers of the heaven shaken. He's talking about political powers. Well, you know, in some context, I would, I would accept that, and I would agree with that. I would, there are places in the Bible where, indeed, I think political powers are described in such terms. But what I've got to do is look at how Jesus is using words here in this context. And I would argue that up to this point, there's nothing figurative about what he said. He, when he's talking about wars and rumors of wars, he's talking about real war. When he talks about famine, he's talking about real famine. 
Uh, when he talks about the holy place, he's talking about the place where the temple is. It's a literal place. Uh, and uh, everything he says here is, uh, you know, and it's clear when he's talking about things that will happen. Now, he uses metaphor. He says, well, this is like a woman laboring in birth. Uh, okay, but again, clearly he's, he's, he's telling us it's the beginning of birth pains. We know that's a metaphor. But here, uh, I don't, there's nothing in this that makes me think this is a metaphor. I think that with the return of Christ, as we saw in the book of Revelation, there's going to be cosmic signs. Uh, and this is not new. There were cosmic signs. Uh, the sun was uh, like in the plagues of Egypt. They had darkness. The sun and the moon didn't shine. There was a, one of the plagues was darkness. Um, in the crucifixion, during the crucifixion, there's darkness. There's, there's there are cosmic signs. Uh, and even though those places are local, I think when Jesus returns, I think the whole world's going to see. Um, and he talks here about the whole world seeing it because he said, verse 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Uh, elsewhere in those scriptures, it talks about they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Uh, so when Jesus comes, he says, you don't have to wonder about it. You won't have to wonder, was, was that it? Did, did we see him? You'll know it's him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. If you overlay this, remember we've talked about the covenants, we've, and we talked about Romans 9, 10, and 11, where Paul talks about uh, the Jews. Here's the question, is could it be that at that moment when Christ returns, that there will be uh, many Jews who have been looking for a Messiah and not understood that it was Jesus, who might then, at that moment, like the thief on the cross, sort of put it together and say, oh, that's him. I don't know. Uh, I, I pray and hope for anybody's salvation. I do not know at what point. I know this, that after this happens, it's too late. After this happens, the book of Revelation, I think, makes it clear there is no salvation, there's no escape. But when it says here that they look upon him and they mourn, no doubt some will mourn because they realize their guilt and that their, their opportunity is gone. It might be that some mourn in repentance. I do not know. I, 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 I pray that even then there might be opportunity for some to trust Christ, but I, I simply do not know. I know this. Today there's opportunity. Right now there's opportunity. Today there's both opportunity and every motive for us to share the gospel with others, and especially our Jewish friends. Um, man, I, I go to Israel, and I just I feel the weight of their lostness. They're so zealous, like Paul talked about in Romans 9, 10, 11. They have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. I mean, those guys go to the Wailing Wall, the, the Western Wall. They, they don't like us to say Wailing Wall, but they go to the Western Wall every day. And they will stand there and pray every day and reading the scriptures. We go up in that tunnel there by the Western Wall, and that is considered by the Jews a synagogue because it, it is by the temple and they they believe the ark of the covenants up under there somewhere and uh, it's it's one of the places where women can go to pray and every time we go up there there are women who come up in that tunnel and they sit there all day long praying and they weep and they're they're praying for the messiah to come and to rebuild the temple not understanding that the messiah has come and he's built a temple and that they can come into that temple right now. It's not, a, it's not a temple made with hands. It's better than that. 
It's the church of the living God, and their Messiah has come. Man, I, I just I walk by them. I feel the, the weight of that. And so when Christ comes, could it be that in that instant, as Paul says in Romans 11, and so all Israel shall be saved, in this way uh, that the remnant within Israel will come to know Christ. I do not know. Uh, I know that there are some saved in every generation, but it could be that even then that there are some saved at that moment when he comes. But I know afterward it's too late. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Remember Jesus said that, he told the parable of the, the wheat and the tares, you remember that? That an enemy came, you know, a guy sowed his field full of wheat, and an enemy came in the night and he sowed weeds you know the way johnson grass sort of looks like corn when corn is young johnson grass going beside it you got to sort of do a double take to figure out which is which at first and that's the way the the, the wheat and the tares are they they look alike early on and so the servant said do you want us to go out there and pluck it up now he said no leave it lest you pull up some of the the wheat but he said uh, in the day of harvest He's going to separate the wheat from the tares. And you and I may not always know the difference between who's really saved and who's not. But when Jesus comes, he'll know. He's going to send his angels, it says, out to gather his elect. He knows whom he has chosen, and he knows who has really chosen him. And it's the same number, by the way. Uh, and he's going to send out his angels to get them. He's not going to miss a one. And he's going to gather them to himself. Now, uh, this, is, this is what Jesus is, how he is answering their question. When will these things be? Well, the temple is going to be destroyed when the armies gather around Jerusalem. You better flee, get out of town because they're going to destroy it. But there's a period of persecution of the Jews and of my people. A period of tribulation that's coming. And when it's over... The Son of Man is going to return. It's not going to be secret. Everybody's going to see. And he's going to send his angels and gather his people home. And that's the way that that chapter unfolds. We'll talk more about it next week. Uh, but, man, it makes my heart cry. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's our prayer. Thank you. I'll see you on Sunday morning.